today, the topic is really a push to chest pain. Um, a lot of these that I will share is really um, uh, cases that I've seen before or uh, from, from the years of practice as a cardiologist. This is what uh, uh, my practice, what I gather, um, gathered over the years of uh, seeing many patients with chest pain. Uh, as you know, as a cardiologist, I mean, patients come with chest pain. This is like the commonest, the commonest reason why patients come to us. Uh, many times, uh, as you also know, uh, the chest pain is non-cardiac, uh, but it is really our responsibility to kind of uh, make sure that we find the right reason for the chest pain and find the right cause for the chest pain and treat the patient appropriately, especially making sure that they don't suddenly die and that we don't miss something which is life-threatening. Um, and so uh, this is really, there's not, a, I'm not going to go a, a lot into science today, but it's really from my own experience and what, what I do, or how I approach chest pain. Okay, so the topic is um, the approach to chest pain. There are two types of chest pain patients. There's a type whereby patients come acutely to the emergency department. Uh, and then there is the one that call up, make an appointment to see you because they've been having chest pain for some time. Okay, so we start off with the acute chest pain patient. I, I shared this patient the last time with, with you. Uh, this is a 45-year-old male, the sailor, had sudden chest pain when he was uh, on the ship and route from China to Singapore. He's a smoker, no other past medical history. But it took him a long time to arrive uh, in Singapore and the moment you arrive, you it's ECG and you see this. So when you when you see this kind of ECG, uh, you know, there's no doubt. You know what the cause of the chest pain is. Uh, and you know the, the, the next steps are quite straightforward and you've got to treat the patient uh, for ST elevation MI. So this patient has an acute anterior ST elevation. ST elevation is quite obvious, you know what to do. You need to bring the patient to the cath lab the artery. Uh, so this is before before I'm blocking. This is the artery after we I put a stand into the left main into the left anterior descending uh, artery. And um, you know these kind of cases are quite straightforward. You know. Now, when you see a patient with chest pain, uh, we, the first thing as a cardiologist, and and I think most of us, whenever you think about chest pain, the first thing you think about is whether this patient is having a heart attack uh, in a patient with acute chest pain. So to understand the spectrum of acute coronary syndrome, uh, the terminology, we, we, we split acute coronary syndrome to no ST segment elevation as well as sec ST segment elevation. So just to go back one step, it's acute coronary syndrome is basically, I mean, in layman's term, it's a heart attack. But it's not just a heart attack because... Um, you know, damage to the myocardium can be due to many things. It can be due to myocarditis. It can be due to a systemic inflammatory response. Um, when we say acute coronary syndrome, we mean that there's something wrong with the coronary artery. And the typical cause for acute coronary syndrome is basically atherosclerosis of coronary arteries causing narrowing. And then you get a plug rupture. Plug rupture leads, leads to thrombosis in the, in the coronary artery. And then the patient gets chest pain. Okay, so I think most of us know uh, the physiology of a coronary syndrome. And we split it into non-ST and ST segment elevation. So if there's ST segment elevation, you don't need to wait for a blood test or a CK, CKMB or troponin T. Uh, you treat the patient immediately because we know that to, um, to, to achieve reperfusion to a good coronary artery, uh, that's the most important thing in ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions. You want to achieve reperfusion as soon as possible. But if there's no ST segment elevation, then we split it into unstable angina as well as non-ST elevation myocardial infarction or in short, NSTEMI. So you know this, if you have an abnormal cardiac bio biomarker, then uh, we call it the NSTEMI. If the troponin and the CKC can be is normal, but yet you think that this it's an acute coronary syndrome, then the diagnosis is what we call unstable angina. Okay, so this is the spectrum of acute coronary syndrome. One of the things that I want to highlight is that, um, and I think I've said this during the um, uh, 
uh, ECG talk as well, is that if you have a patient coming with, a, a, you know, acute chest pain and the chest pain is persistent, uh, sweating away in front of you, he's saying, doc, you know, the chest pain is very severe. Uh, you don't see any ST elevation. You need to think about the fact that in some situations, the coronary artery is still occluded. It's 100% occluded. And maybe for this particular patient, you may still need to activate emergency uh, uh, coronary angiogram as well as emergency cutaneous coronary intervention. I'll give you some examples. One is if the patient has, severe, uh, has a totally occluded left circumflex artery. If the left circumflex artery is not very big, the, the coronary artery is occluded, the patient will have constant chest pain uh, and you know, maybe no ST segment elevation on the ECG. These kind of patients you may need to get bring the patient to um, the care lab early. Another example will be a patient with recurrent myocardial infarction in the same territory. So for example, I had a patient who had I think three or four inferior STEMIs, all due to uh, RCA occlusion. On the fifth one, when he came to the hospital, there was no ST changes at all. But he was in severe pain and he tell you, doctor, this is the same pain as I had when I had all my other previous heart attacks. Okay. And so you should take this kind of patients seriously. If they have a occluded artery in, a, in an area whereby they had recurrent myocardial infarction, Sometimes you don't see the ST elevation. And, when, and true enough, I brought him, I activated acute PCI, brought him to the cath lab, and he had a totally occluded right coronary artery. The moment you revascularize, the chest pain is gone. So uh, don't just look at ST elevation or uh, decision making. If you think that the patient has a totally occluded, 100% occluded coronary artery, you may still want to activate uh, acute PCI. This is the same ECG I showed uh, last week during the ECG talk. Um, and, you know, it looks like a fairly okay ECG. Uh, you've got to look at the, you could don't miss the ST sagging and don't miss the evolved high lateral MI, okay, the T inversion in lead one and lead AVL. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, lead one and lead AVL. And this is uh, a patient with a high lateral uh, myocardial infarction and probably has a diagonal or um, a, a very tight proximal LED uh, stenosis with some thrombus in the diagonal branch. Okay, so don't miss this kind of such CTGs. So for the acute um, chest pain patient, we talked about heart attacks or acute myocardial infarction, but we've got to think uh, really about life-threatening conditions and learn to exclude these life-threatening conditions. So in your mind, when you see a patient with severe chest pain or acutely come to the A&E with chest pain, these are some of the things that you have to think about. So the top of the list is whether the patient is having an acute myocardial infarction. Then the next thing is, is that this have, patient have acute pulmonary embolism. And so you have to think about risk factors. So if the patient has got family history of heart attacks, is a smoker, is a diabetic, in with chest pain, uh, even if the ECG is normal, you've got to think about whether the patient just had a myocardial infarction. If the patient is a post-surgical patient, just had a, a, a knee replacement, a week ago, just discharged from the hospital, now comes in with uh, chest pain and breathlessness. And if you if the heart rate is high, tachycardic, you know, you've got to think about acute pulmonary embolism. If this patient has got um, a family history of uh, thrombosis and his father is also had, had a pulmonary embolism before or the patient just off, uh, a few days ago from a long distance flight. Uh, and don't think that the pulmonary embolism can just happen on the day of the flight, but it can happen even after a week after the patient has had a long distance flight. Then you've got to think about uh, the diagnosis of the pulmonary embolism. Okay. Miss thoracic chaotic dissections because this can kill. And this can be very, uh, very subtle. I had a patient who drove from Malaysia. If you know Malaysia and Singapore, we are connected by land. And so he drove from uh, Kuala Lumpur to Singapore. And while he was driving, he had quite severe chest pain. He had to stop for a while, rest for a while. But after about half an hour, the chest pain went away. 
Okay, and he continued to drive back to Singapore, came to the hospital because he felt that something was wrong uh, and saw the doctor, the doctor admitted. But ECG was normal, he was asymptomatic. Everything was normal, blood pressure was normal, everything was normal. Uh, and he came to the hospital. I saw him close to midnight because by the time he was uh, admitted, it was close to midnight. I came to the hospital, I looked at him, he was sleeping already. You know, so you see this very comfortable guy sleeping in bed. I woke him up, asked him about the history, sounded really strange and sounded really like something quite serious. Um, and um, I ran a D-dimer for him and the D-dimer was very high. So uh, very quickly got a CT scan for his chest uh, and you know, true enough, he had a Stanford B uh, sending thoracic, sending uh, thoracic aorta, uh, aorta, uh, sending aorta uh, in the thoracic segment um, that was dissected. Yeah. And so we got to be careful about aortic dissection because this is one of the commonest missed di diagnoses as well as the commonest cause of patient going home from A and E and then suddenly dying. Okay. Um, because many times the pain is gone by the time they arrive in the hospital. And you may not, uh, you may look at the patient and the patient looks really well to you. I have a I had a colleague also um, uh, had a patient with chest pain uh, and didn't think about it dissection, even put the patient on the treadmill. Uh, and the patient was okay on the treadmill. And then on the third day of day, I'm not sure, in the hospital, the patient was found dead. Okay, so uh, so you have to really think about this diagnosis so that you don't miss it, okay? Myocarditis and pericarditis is another reason why patient comes to the hospital with chest pain. Uh, and I can tell you, you know, some of the sickest patients we see uh, in cardiology are the myocarditis patients. So you have these patients coming with uh, chest pain. Some of them has ST elevation. Some of them have ST depression. You bring them to the cath lab. You do the coronary angiogram. Uh, the, the coronary angiogram is normal. And the troponin is very high. And then, you know, basically your heart sinks because you know that for the next one week, your life is going to be quite tough because this patient is going to be very, very sick. They're going to have VT, they're going to have AF, they're going to need IABP, uh, sometimes extracorporeal brain oxygenation. The nurses are going to call you at night, you know, and this, this patient is going to keep you up at night for many days. Okay, so um, don't underestimate myocarditis because myocarditis patients can be very, very sick. Okay, pericarditis is quite easy to diagnose. Um, the ECG will be quite typical of uh, this saddle-shaped diffuse ST elevation. We've talked about this uh, last week during the ECG talk. Okay, so don't miss this. Now, acute cholecystitis. Uh, I want to tell you that a lot of the choli acute cholecystitis comes to the cardiology. Okay, and uh, and we have to refer them to the upper GI surgeon or the general surgeon quite often. Um, and some of them will come with uh, severe chest pain. Uh, and you know how pain during the colic can be very, very severe. And, and surprisingly, uh, quite a lot of these patients don't come with right hypochondriac pain, but they come with lower uh, substernal chest pain. Uh, and this is always a diagnosis that I think about, especially if the patient tells me that the pain is, uh, you know, comes and goes quite severe after a, a, a meal um, and, you know, severe enough for them to break out in full sweat. And, um, you know, one of the clues is that the next day, sometimes the liver function becomes normal on the blood test. Okay, so don't, don't forget this diagnosis of cholecystitis, cholangitis, or biliary colic. Sometimes there's no cholecystitis. The Murphy signs is negative. There's no tenderness at all, but it was a past stone, a past gallstone, then uh, that can cause severe chest pain. Now and again, you will see patients who've been suffering with chest pain on and off, on and off for years. And everybody's been treating them for gastric reflux, treating them for uh, uh, coronary artery disease. And nobody did an, an ultrasound of the liver um, or an ultrasound of the gallbladder. And, and there, are, there have been people who have been suffering from chest pain for a long time. And actually, it's biliary colic. And the moment you do the cholecystectomy and remove the gallbladder, 
they have no more pain at all. Okay, even those patients with severe coronary artery stenosis, they, uh, you know, when the symptom doesn't really sound like angina, you have to be suspic suspicious that there may be something else. And the severe coronary artery disease may just be a red herring, you know, and you can go in and stand the patient, and then after that, the patient is still having chest pain. Okay, so think about it. Rarely, you may get some esophageal uh, disease, uh, just like esophageal fistula. I had a, a colleague also uh, many years ago who had a patient who was admitted with chest pain, and spiking fever every day, uh, and they were, I'm not sure what they were treating the patient for, but essentially on about day five or something like that, also the patient suddenly collapsed and died. And they found out that it was actually a leaking, uh, um, an, an esophageal abscess that was uh, brewing and then it eroded into the aorta and then the patient bled. And died. And so, so uh, you know, this can sometimes happen when the patient swallow a fish bone, for example, or a chicken bone that got stuck in the esophagus and created an abscess. So think about this as well. Pneumothorax, of course, clinically you can diagnose pneumothorax. Uh, a simple chest x-ray will give you the diagnosis most of the time. Okay, uh, and pneumonia. Pneumonia can also come with chest pain, but typically there will be some cough, phlegm, there will be some fever. Again, a simple chest x-ray can make a diagnosis. So these are some of the things that you can think about. I think the history is essential. Um, physical examination is also important, but actually to me, history is the most important. So don't take shortcuts, but spend time asking the patient about the pain when it starts how it feels like, what, what is the nature of the pain, how long does the pain last, is there anything that triggers the pain. Uh, you know, you know, typical angina is on, on exertion, but of course, unstable angina can come at rest. You know, the typical substernal chest pain radiating to the left arm, radiating to the jaw, then of course, you have to think about uh, ischemic heart disease and angina. So we talked about this, the risk of VT causing pulmonary embolism, but to think about travel history, malignancies. If the patient has known malignancy, then you really have to think about pulmonary embolism. Uh, if the patient uh, uh, has symptoms that suggest that they have some malignancy, think about pulmonary embolism. Okay, I've got a patient also uh, who came in with leg swelling, with, with breathlessness, uh, turned out to be um, colon cancer. Everybody was treating her for ischemic heart disease, for heart failure, uh, and all that. And, you know, it's just something wrong with her. She was a little bit tachycardic. And I just did a CT scan of the, the, the lungs and the pulmonary embolism. And then we searched for the malignancy, you know, and did some scopes and up scopes and down scopes. There was a of mild anemia, and she was found to have a VA colon. You know, and, and hopefully, when you find it at an at a early stage, you know, their, their prognosis is not too bad. So uh, ask about symptoms of infection, uh, ask about neurological symptoms. So if you have a dissection of the aortic arc, uh, sometimes the dissection can go into the carotid artery, into the brachycephalic artery, patient may have vertigo, patient have, may have transient weakness. Uh, and usually when the dissection stops, the blood flow to the brain is okay and the, there is no, there may not be any permanent neurological symptoms. But you know, whenever the patient says, I feel but I go with this kind of spinning dizziness. I felt suddenly weak or I fainted or I, I had to sit down, you know, because I couldn't stand up for a moment. And then you have severe chest pain think about uh, aortic dissection, okay? Abdominal symptoms has possibly biliary colic. So some of the tests that we order um, in the acute patient, will be an ECG, of course. So if you do an ECG and you see obvious ST depression, ST elevation, uh, you know, pick of uh, ischemic heart disease, then you've got your answer, okay? We run bloods. So CK, CKMB, and troponin are important bloods to run uh, because you need to exclude uh, myocardial infarction. And we'll talk a little bit about this. Full blood count is important. The hemoglobin is important, okay? So if the patient has got the... Uh, um, like a bleeding GIT, you know, severe perforated ulcer, or you know, that sometimes radiate to the chest when they have the pain. Uh, you got to you got to think about this, okay? If they have raised white cell count, then you got to think about things like pneumonia, whether there's some kind of 
infection, esophagus. I had a patient who came in with severe chest pain, had esophageal candidiasis, you know, uh, and, you know, you've got to kind of suspect some of these things depending on some of the blood counts as well. Liver function tests, as I said, uh, many times in a patient with biliary colic, they have passed out a stone or acute cholecystitis, will get some transaminitis. Uh, and sometimes um, in patients with very severe gastric reflux, you might get raised amylase. Um, B-dimer is a very important blood test. I do it for every patient who comes through A&E with chest pain. Okay? Because I, I think most of the time it's normal, but if you pick one and you pick up an aortic bisection or pulmonary embolism, it's definitely worthwhile to do this blood test because you don't want to miss this diagnosis where the patient can die. C-reactive protein gives me some reassurance. If C-reactive protein is flat, then kind of reassures me that whatever the patient is having, the chest pain may not be something be very severe. If the C-reactive protein is very high, then you could really look hard for a cause, okay? This actually will tell us things like pneumonia, pneumothorax, wider mediastinum in the LT dissection, okay? And sometimes a side echocardiogram can tell you, especially like I said, if you have a occluded circumflex artery and the patient is having chest pain, the ECG looks normal. You don't want to wait for the troponin on the CT can be a side echocardiogram. If you see segmental wall and abnormalities in the in the posterior wall or inferior wall, then you have your answer. Understanding the rise and fall of troponin and CKCKMB is very important, okay? So I think we all know this, but it's just, just a reminder for uh, maybe some of us who are not cardiologists. Um, uh, you know, CKMB rises in the first six to eight hours in a myocardial infarction. But the other thing is that it, it disappears quite fast. So within 48, 72 hours, the CKMB will disappear. Troponin rises also within the first, nowadays with the high sensitivity troponin, uh, it rises within the first four to six hours, and then it will linger on for a while. So troponin I lingers on for about 10 days. Troponin T can linger on for up to 15 days. Okay? So why is this important to understand? So if you come with a chest pain, patient comes with a chest pain, you do the troponin. Troponin is 1,000. And then you do the CKMB, CKMB is three, which is normal. Then you know that uh, the heart attack happened definitely more than three days ago. Because if the heart attack happened recently, the CKMB should be quite high. If you have a troponin of 1,000, the CKMB will definitely be like 30 to 50 if it is a very recent myocardial infarction. If the myocardial infarction happened a few days ago or a week ago, then you will still have a troponin that is raised. Uh, but the myocardial, but the CKMB will be normal. Another good use for this kind of trending is if the patient had a re infarction. If the patient came in with a myocardial infarction, you standard the patient. Then on day four, the patient complained of chest pain again. On day four, if the CKMB is quite high, then you think that something is wrong. Something has happened to the coronary artery again. And so the patient may have a repeat uh, or a recurrent uh, heart attack. On day four, if the CKMB is totally flat and normal, but the troponin is still high, then you're a little bit more reassured. Sometimes the chest pain may be the pericarditis uh, from restless syndrome. Sometimes the chest pain may be even non-cardiac, maybe gastric reflux from your aspirin that you're given to the patient. Okay. Um, the other thing is to know the rise of... So obviously, if the patient had a chest pain one hour ago, the patient came to the hospital, and you do the troponin and you do the CKMB, and it's normal, does that mean the patient didn't have a heart attack? Not really, because the troponin and CKMB sometimes become abnormal only after about four hours for troponin and maybe after six hours for CKMB. So uh, you need to know uh, these things to decide whether the, to repeat the troponin and CKMB. I find that junior doctors always order this routine, CK, CKMB, troponin, T every eight hours times three. Okay, I don't know whether in Myanmar it's done the same way, but uh, sometimes we don't need to keep poking the patient and keep torturing the patient with blood tests to do these three sets of cardiac enzymes. If the first set is within six hours and it's normal, sometimes I don't even repeat the second set. But if the first set is like within like four hours and it's normal, then you repeat another set maybe in about eight hours' time uh, after the onset of chest pain. If it's still normal, you don't have to repeat anymore. Okay. P-dimer is a very, very important blood test. 
I, I just want to say that, uh, you know, if you have the facilities to run, uh, you know, do it because you, you can pick up some really severe disease and then you don't miss things, okay? Um, it's, it's also quite an irritating test because if you have an abnormal D-dimer, sometimes you don't know what Sometimes you don't know what to do with this dimer test results because you can't find anything that is wrong with the patient, okay? But I just want to tell you from my experience, these are some of the things that I think about when I see a D-dimer. So when you see D-dimer uh, abnormal and you think that the patient has some risk factors for pulmonary embolism, then do the CT pulmonary angiogram, make sure that the patient doesn't have pulmonary embolism. Especially if you have one D-dimer and the D-dimer is above 1,000 or above one, depending on unit you use. But if the D-dimer is above 1,000, then you've really got a ticket slip. If the D-dimer is between 500 to 1,000, because 500 is a cutoff for normal, so less than 500 is normal. If the D-dimer is between 500 to 1,000, then you've got to think maybe it's not something which is so serious. Sometimes for women, it could just be their menses that causes the D-dimer to be raised. Okay. Um, aortic dissection, I mentioned about this. If you have an aortic dissection, invariably you will have an intraluminal hematoma. If you have an intraluminal hematoma in the aortic wall, you will definitely have a raised D-dimer. Okay, so if you don't have a raised D-dimer, then the diagnosis of aortic dissection is really, really uh, going to be rare. Okay. Um, sepsis uh, can also cause D-dimer. So if the patient has pneumonia uh, and it's sepsis, then the D-dimer can also be raised because of a kind of a, like a mild DIV uh, state. If the patient has malignancy, then the D-dimer will be raised. So sometimes the patient comes in with chest pain, it may not, it may be totally unrelated to the malignancy, but when I do a D-dimer and I find that it is raised and I search hard enough, uh, sometimes you manage to find the malignancy for a patient who otherwise did not come for symptoms of this malignancy, okay? In severe heart failure, the D-dimer can also be raised. In AF with a left atrial appendage clot, uh, sometimes the D-dimer will be mildly raised. Uh, I had a patient recently who um, had AF, came into the hospital, I ran, I ran a D-dimer and it was mildly raised, but this patient refused anticoagulation for the AF because he was too worried about uh, um, uh, you know, bleeding risk. Even an echo, I didn't see any cause. You know, a trans thoracic echo is very hard to see left atrial appendage clot. And this particular patient, two weeks later, had a big stroke. Okay, so, um, you know, in patients with AF and the D-dimer is raised, we, we really got to be suspicious that there may be an intracardiac clot. Um, the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, is the most common uh, vaccine in Singapore. I'm, I'm really not sure about the AstraZeneca vaccine because we don't have any experience with that in Singapore. Quite frequently, we will see raised D-dimer in patients who had, had their vaccine. Uh, and usually, this D-dimer is not, is not more than a 1,000. Okay? So sometimes, uh, you can see this in the post-patients post-mRNA vaccine for the COVID vaccine. Anaphylaxis is another uh, reason for raised D-dimer. I had a patient with anaphylaxis and the D-dimer was 14,000. I've never seen a D-dimer so high before. I searched everywhere for tumor, for malignancy, for pulmonary embolism, <laughs> aortic dissection, there was nothing. So, and eventually as our patient, it, it almost normalized. The D-dimer came down to like 700. Um, and so I'm gonna do another one for her in a few months time and hopefully it's normal. So I think it was due to anaphylaxis because she came in with anaphylaxis. Autoimmune diseases can cause raised D-dimer. Pregnancy can cause raised D-dimer. So in the pregnant women, do D-dimer, it doesn't really tell you much because almost all pregnant women will have raised D-dimer. And of course, post-surgery, if you do a D-dimer, also doesn't give you much uh, information because the D-dimer will be raised. Okay. So let's move on now. The clinic chest pain patient. Okay. So we talked about the acute chest pain patient who comes to, to a and &E. And then there are also the clinic ones, the ones who come to you, they are well, they just come to you because they've been worrying about this chest pain. Okay, so for example, the five-year-old male, no past medical history, is a smoker, comes to you with intermittent chest pain for a month. So how, what's your approach to this kind of patient? So we've got to categorize the chest pain into three categories. Is this typical angina? Typical angina means that when you walk, 
they get chest tightness, substernal, uh, uh, and radius to the arm, radius to the jaw, you know, the typical kind of angina. Or is it an atypical angina? For example, uh, in women or in elderly patients, they may have exertional breathlessness. Or when they have um, chest pain, uh, it, it, it's like in the back, you know, um, or they have in the jaw, but nothing in the chest. Uh, so, or, you know, I had a patient with a circumflex uh, stenosis. He had chest pain only in the axilla area in the left as well as the back. So these are what we call atypical angina. It could still be angina, um, but it is not the typical type. Okay. And then there's the obvious non-cardiac chest pain, you know, the, where the patient can tell you right here where my finger is pointing, it's painful. When I press, it's painful. When I take a deep breath, it's painful. Okay? So that typically is non is a non-cardiac chest pain. So um, differential diagnosis, what do you think about? The commonest cause of chest pain is really these three, okay? So the, the top three, if you think about chest pain coming to you with chest pain, is it's a muscular skeletal pain, gastroesophageal reflux, or actually the patient has ischemic heart disease, okay? So these are the three things that you think about. Uh, and in your history taking, you've got to ask about different features of this uh, in, okay, in gastroesophageal reflux, I must say many of the patients don't have any abdominal symptoms. And sometimes, if you're not sure what the cause is, you give them a trial or treatment with uh, uh, pump, pump inhibitors to see whether it could actually be gastroesophageal reflux. Many of them actually don't have, uh, have you know, abdominal symptoms or belching or burping or things like that. The respiratory physician will tell you that chronic cough due to gastro, gastric reflux, in 60% of chronic cough from gastric reflux, they don't have gastric reflux symptoms. Okay, so don't be fooled just because the patient tells you, I've got no tummy problems, I've got no stomach pain, I've got no belching, it could still be gastroesophageal reflux. Okay. Other causes that you've got to think about biliary colic. We talk about this. You know, patients can suffer with biliary colic for a year or two years before somebody diagnoses them with it. Okay, so if you think it sounds like biliary colic, the ultrasound of the goblet. Stress reaction or panic attack. So, so this is again something common that we see. Uh, some patients during very stressful times, um, you know, the, the chest wall muscles can cramp and they can have quite bad pain in the chest. And then that makes them even more concerned because they think that they're having a chest, a, a heart attack. They go into hyperventilation, causes even more chest muscle cramps, you know, and then they get all this pain. So even patients with severe coronary artery disease can still have panic attack. Okay, so uh, you kind of think about this at the back of your mind um, because, you know, even after you go and unblock the arteries and send them, they still have chest pain. Okay, so you have to be careful about this. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because of the increased demand of the myocardium, can sometimes cause chest pain, especially if they exert themselves. Pericarditis or pericardial effusion, if a patient has a slow growing pericardial effusion, like from a lung cancer or from a liver cancer, you know, they can have chest pain as well and can be something that is more long, uh, intermediate duration, may not come to you. Mediastinal tumor. Uh, so if you have a tumor in the mediastinum, it can also cause chest pain. I had a patient um, once who saw another cardiologist and uh, uh, had kids having chest pain. And then the cardiologist did a CT coronary and CT scan for the chest. But you know, sometimes in our busy practice in cardiology, you may be too busy to look at the other findings. And uh, it was missed that the radiologist actually reported the patient had a mediastinal tumor. So the patient was just treated as for minor coronary artery disease, says his muscular skeletal chest pain, and then uh, was discharged. But uh, you know, like six months later, the patient came uh, with a pleural effusion now on the right. Uh, and obviously, it's a bit more easy for me to make that diagnosis because the patient has a pleural effusion. But just looking back at the CT scan six months ago, you see that the CT scan already reported a mediastinal tumor. And you know, uh, patient thankfully had surgery, had uh, chemotherapy, and it's quite well known. Esophageal disease, like I told you um, just now, I had one patient with candida in the esophagus, 
and had severe chest pain. I had another patient uh, with severe chest pain and, and um, you know, I, I, and I will talk about this later. I commonly do either a CT coronary angiogram or a CT calcium score, which is pretty much harmless. And for this patient, the CT calcium score picked up the esophageal diverticulum and I uh, referred him to a surgeon. The surgeon came in the scope and then eventually uh, did surgery to remove this uh, diverticulum because it was really causing a lot of pain for the patient. His food was getting stuck in this diverticulum. Varicella very zoster or shingles, this is something that you have to think about. Um, on and off, we will have patients coming with chest pain. Chest pain is in a certain dermatome in the chest, usually the left-sided E4 dermatome gets confused as chest pain from the heart. And initially, the patient may not have rash, okay? but uh, you've got to look for the rash uh, and you've got to ask the patient to look out for a rash because sometimes uh, this is actually zoster. Aortic ulcer or chronic dissection of the aorta can also come uh, with chronic chest pain. Um, this can sometimes be on the echocardiogram because you can see the thrombus aorta, um, the ascending aorta, and sometimes in the descending thoracic aorta. Uh, but you've got to think about this. And if you think that there could be a risk of uh, dissection, then do a CT scan. And I will talk to you about the CT scans because the CT scan is actually very, very useful. Uh, one thing I want to say as we talk about approach to treating heart, uh, treating chest pain is that as cardiologists or as any doctors, we are not here just to exclude heart disease or life-threatening disease, but we are here to solve the patient's problem. Okay, so there are some doctors who will say, uh, you don't have a heart problem, there is no lung problem, you know, there's no life-threatening problem. I don't know what problem you have, but it's not my problem. <laughs> so, so I think as doctors, we have try to solve the patient's problem and, and not say that there's nothing that will kill you, just go, go you know, and, and just leave it. But we, we try to make a diagnosis to figure out what the patient's problem is and treat the patient so that they can get better, okay? Sorry, um, uh, sorry this is just a kind of a repeat. Uh, I'm sorry, no, this, this slide is about mus muscular skeletal chest pain. Uh, just, uh, I prepared this slide so fast, I, I forgot what I want to say, but okay. So just one slide about muscular chest, skeletal chest pain. Muscular skeletal chest pain is not just muscular skeletal chest pain, okay? So of course the commonest reason is because the patient did some heavy exercise, strain the muscles and now have muscle cramp or train the chest wall and inflammation of the costochondral joint and now have costochondritis, okay? But think about one step further is why does the patient have muscle pain? Okay, so one of the common things that we miss out is this thing called obstructive sleep apnea. We all know what obstructive sleep apnea is, and uh, very frequently patients with obstructive sleep apnea have a lot of muscle pain in the chest. And I think it's because they struggle a lot to breathe at night because of the obstruction, and the chest wall has to overwork itself. Okay, the other very common thing is in patients who sit in front of the computer the whole day, because of the posture, they have neck pain, and then they have chest pain. So this is called what we call upper cross syndrome, whereby the chest wall and the neck, uh, sorry, the chest muscle and the neck muscle has to work together to support the patient's uh, torso. And after a while, typically in patients who sit in front of computers for hours and hours, then they get a lot of chest pain, okay? Autoimmune costochondritis. So if you have these young ladies coming to you with recurrent costochondritis, you have to think about autoimmune disease, not not uncommonly, I diagnose Sjogren syndrome, uh, lupus, you know, uh, um, in, just from the, the fact that the patient presented with costochondritis or even rheumatoid arthritis, they can present with costochondritis. Don't forget to sometimes, if it's severe and they're recurrent, think about running some blood tests to exclude autoimmune disease, okay? Sometimes you may miss a rib fracture. Sometimes the patient may have a rib tumor that can cause the pain. Uh, fibromyalgia is another uh, reason if the patient has multiple spots of pain and is tender, think about fibromyalgia. Scoliosis obviously can predispose to muscle pain and rarely, rarely thoracic radiculopathy. I must say, I have done some uh, MRI thoracic spines to look for, to look for uh, uh, you know, nerve compression, but so far I've never found a patient uh, with thoracic radiculopathy, but this, it, it exists. 
Uh, it's rare, but some patients may, especially if they have scoliosis, they may have uh, impingement of the thoracic nerve, uh, thoracic uh, um, uh, exit nerve endings, and, and that can cause, okay? Uh, so the next thing is, how do we test? What test do we do for these patients? So um, if we heard of Bayes' theorem, Bayes' theorem is too complicated for me to explain, um, but in my simple understanding of Bayes' theorem is that all the tests we do, there are some flaws in it, okay? So there are false positives, there are false negatives when we do certain tests. So when we choose a test, we've got to choose a test based on what we think the pre-test probability is for the patient. For example, if you have a 20-year-old male uh, who has chest pain, and you put a 20-year-old male on the treadmill, and even if the treadmill is abnormal, the patient have um, uh, uh, significant coronary artery stenosis, you know, maybe not um, because the pretest probability for this patient is very, very low that he has significant coronary artery disease. Um, so even if you put the patient on the treadmill, the abnormal treadmill does not increase your pretest probability to have a much higher post test probability of a, of a severe coronary artery disease. So, um, whereas if you do a if you have a 70-year-old guy who is diabetic who has pain typical of angina, and you put the patient on the treadmill, and the treadmill is normal, does that mean that the patient doesn't have ischemic heart disease? No, because the, the pre-test probability of this patient is very high that he has ischemic heart disease, and the treadmill does not improve the post-test probability. Whereas if you do a CT scan for the patient, a CT coronary angiogram, or you do a diagnostic coronary angiogram, then it changes the, the test probability and, and it, it becomes a test that makes more sense. Okay, so what test you choose depending on, it depends on what you think the patient has and what the pretest uh, possibility is, okay? So the test you do needs to convincingly uh, include a disease or convincingly exclude the disease. So how do we approach? When we approach, again, the chest pain patient that comes to the clinic, You've got to do an ECG, okay? Because the ECG can sometimes tell you nothing, but if, when it tells you something, you already have the answer. So it's an easy, easy, easy test. Uh, we do echocardiograms to look for structural abnormalities that can cause chest pain. Sometimes it can pick up aortic dissection. Sometimes it can you will see right ventricular dilatation, you know, pick up pulmonary embolism. Uh, and sometimes you pick up a uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that can also cause chest pain. Severe aortic stenosis can also cause chest pain. Okay? Stress testing is something that we do very frequently, but I will have a word about stress testing after this. Okay, So stress testing can be due to, can be a treadmill, can be a stress echo, can be myocardial fusion imaging. Uh, it is useful, but it's only useful for certain things. Okay? Sometimes the test to try the treatment so like I said, if for patients with gastric reflux, sometimes the test is to try giving them treatment for it. And if after two weeks of treatment, they are perfectly fine, the pain goes away, then there's gastric reflux. Test x-ray is useful, although I, I must say I don't do it for every patient, um, but I do send patients for CT scans, okay? So if I think that the patient has quite high probability of having ischemic heart disease, then I send them for CT coronary angiogram. Even if I don't think that they have high probability of ischemic heart disease, that means it's not severe coronary artery disease, I still send most of my middle-aged men patients and above, so if they are like 45 or 50 years old and above, I frequently advise them or try to convince them to do a CT calcium score. So a CT calcium score is a very simple test. It's five minutes. There's no contrast. There's no pain, you don't have to fast. The radiation is so little, it's probably negligible. But a CT calcium score can really pick up a lot of things. Okay, So it gives you that sense of security that uh, you've not missed a, a, a life-threatening thing for a patient. So the patient could have a normal ECG, normal echocardiogram, normal treadmill test, but I still send them for a calcium score because if the calcium score picks up minor coronary artery disease, then you, you start the patient on statins, sometimes on antiplatelets, and then you've saved a life because the patient tends to do quite well and then you know, the risk of a heart attack is much lower. If you send them for CT calcium scores, you pick up strange things as well. Like I told you, 
Well, I had one patient, esophageal diverticulum, who picked up on the calcium score. I had a patient with mediastinal tumor. I had a patient with lung disease, you know, picked up on CT calcium score. So it can pick up a lot of things. I just want to give you an example. I had a patient, I sent him for a calcium score. Calcium score is one. Okay, he is a big uh, uh, obese patient, had sleep apnea. I started him on uh, Crestor. He defaulted after two months. And a year later, he only had a calcium score of one. A year later, he came with an inferior STEMI. He had totally the RCA, had a massive myocardial infarction. Okay, so if only he continued his statins, I think he would have avoided the heart attack. And he was only 45 or so. Okay, sometimes we may need to go and do conventional angiogram um, uh, for the patient okay, to look for coronary artery disease. Stress testing. I just want to say some things on stress testing. You can do a treadmill exercise ECG. It's simple and economical, but not everybody can run on the treadmill and not every ECG can be integrated. But so please don't send a patient with a left bundle branch block on the ECG or Wu Parkinson white ECGs. If you put them on a treadmill to look for ischemic heart disease, then you, know, you can't integrate these ECGs. Uh, exercise echocardiogram is better than a treadmill test, but it's operate independent. So it depends on who does it. And it's quite tedious. Uh. Yeah, myocardial vision scan uh, may have the best sensitivity and specificity, but it's not widely available in all places. Sometimes it's quite hard to get this, okay? But what I want to say, which is most important, is that stress testing does not exclude coronary artery disease, okay? The biggest mistake that I keep telling the junior doctors not to say to the patient is, your treadmill is normal, there's nothing wrong with your heart, you're fine. Okay, that is the biggest mistake that we can ever say to the patient because not uncommonly, two weeks later, patient have a heart attack, come to the hospital and you, you will write a complaint letter and say, you told me my treadmill was normal, but I still had a heart attack. Okay, so treadmill just tells us that there is no uh, reduction of blood flow to the heart muscle. It tells us that there is no ischemia and it tells us that there is no severe, most likely there's no severe coronary artery stenosis. No, but it does not tell us that the patient has no coronary artery disease. So the patient could be having chest pain for ischemic heart disease and they go on the treadmill and the treadmill can still be reported as normal. Most of the time, their stamina is not so great. They don't go very long on the treadmill, but the treadmill may not show any ischemia, but they still have a severe coronary, uh, severely narrow coronary artery disease and they're still at risk. So that's why we usually need to assess the patients for risk factors and usually need to maybe consider doing a CT calcium score. If you put a CT calcium score and the calcium score is abnormal, you put the patient on the on medication, uh, you know, they usually do very well, okay? Uh, so calcium score or a full CT coronary angiogram with contrast is very useful. We've talked about this. The calcium score is so easy to do and it can tell Sometimes we need to do coronary angiogram Know, to unblock arteries, I won't, I won't belabor this. I just want to say another test that we do during coronary angiogram is what we call fractional flow reserve. Now there is uh, um, um, IFR, uh, um, which, is, which is easier to do. So fractional flow reserve basically is when we do an angiogram, we put a wire across, the wire has a pressure transducer. It can measure pressure after the stenosis, and we compare it with pressure before the stenosis. Okay, so before the stenosis at the cathedral, we can measure pressure. After the stenosis on the wire, we can measure pressure. And we can do a ratio of this pressure over this pressure. Okay, so, so on the during the angiogram, what you see is the as the heart is the pressure waveform, the green color is the pressure from the of the special wire, the FFR wire, uh, and then the red color uh, uh, pressure waveform is from the catheter and then you get a ratio okay so if the ratio is less or equal than 0 0.8 then it means that the stenosis is hemodynamically significant it is reducing blood flow to the heart muscle and therefore uh, you put the stent if the ffr is more than 0 0.8 then we know that um, it is better to treat it medically uh, and if you revascularize them sometimes they do worse okay so um, that's all my slides